Good morning, everyone. How are we all doing today? It's a beautiful sunny day, right? So my name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at the church. Uh, and yes, this morning I get the privilege and opportunity to, to speak with you today about singles and about how to approach uh, the single life in a healthy way and how to treat people who are single in a healthy way as well. Um, because the single community we know now is the fastest growing demographic that we know of because of the fact that people are getting married later and later in life and some people are just not getting married at all. And so single living is now becoming, is just fast growing. And so, and actually in the church, there are more single adults then there are married adults on average in a church. Isn't that crazy? I would have never expected that. And as a result of this idea of the fact that there are so many singles in the church, we have a tendency to kind of overlook them actually, unfortunately. Uh, we don't, because we think that it's going to be more about how many married people there are in the church. And so we have a tendency as churches to focus our programming and our ministry more upon marriage, marriages and families, because I, I think some of that is an overreaction to the culture that we are currently in where the family has broken down. So we've tried to focus more on ministering to families that at some point we have also not ministered to the singles around us. And so to, um, as a result of this, like we have singles in our midst and, and, our, and in the church at large that are feeling actually kind of disgruntled about this idea and feeling somewhat undervalued by the church because they are not being programmed for. And so I, to prepare for this message, I read a book by the name of a One by One by a woman named Gina D'Alfonso. And in her book, she interviewed many single people in order to kind of get full perspective. And she is single herself, but she interviewed some people about their perspective. This is not hard data. This is perspective. This is a feeling. So this woman, Fiona, was talking about uh, perceived messaging by the church and the way that it programmed and some of the messages that came across towards single women. Here's one quote. Women are not fully adult, fully human, or fully complete if they are not married. Marriage is a reward, and if you aren't married, then maybe it's because there are areas of sin or spiritual growth that need to be addressed in order to make you ready. Now remember, this is a perspective. This is kind of how she's felt, how people have treated her in the church. And so that's, that's kind of alarming that they would begin to think that it's marriage is some sort of reward. And we'll just tell you, as we'll see throughout this passage, that's a completely unbiblical idea. It's foreign to the Bible that marriage is a reward for good behavior in any way, shape, or form. But she also said this in reference to single men and women. Single groups are the holding pen between youth and college and full adulthood where you are to mix and mingle only with other singles in order to find your mate and graduate to big church. That is so disheartening to me. Disheartening to hear that there's this demographic of people that feel like they still yet have to graduate by, and they have to get married. And the problem with this perception that, that we could have is that there are singles who are all across the age spectrum. There are some that are in their 20s, yes, and that is, tends to be where our focus is on the young singles, 20s and 30s, but there are peoples that, people, single people that are in their 70s and 80s that if they have this feeling, if they've never been married and they haven't quite graduated, that is alarming and sad. And so this is something that we need to learn and to figure out how we're going to handle this different because as, I've, as I read this book, there are scores of quotes that are just as difficult, maybe some even that are more difficult than this one in that book about their perspective and what they felt, how the church has treated them and some of the culture that the that people in the church have created around singleness. And so this morning, we're going to try and reorient our ideas around what the Bible says. We shouldn't do that about everything, but let's do that this morning about this. What does the Bible say about singleness? What does it say about how this season of singleness works out? And how do we do this? How do we lead people into a healthy living a, a lifestyle when it, within being single? And then as well, how, what does it mean to be single? What is, what is God calling single people to do? And so our main point of what we're going to talk about this morning is that for singles to be healthy, they must recognize that Christ determines the value of their life and that singleness is not a judgment of their character, but an opportunity to serve the Lord as a part of the whole church. 
And so this morning, we're going to consider four principles on how singles can live in a healthy way and that we as a church can ha- kind of walk alongside them, join, join with them, and have them in some ways walk alongside us too so that we can be a better church community and that we can better relate to and minister to the singles that are around us. So right now, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you do not have a Bible, there are brown hardcover back uh, Bibles in the seats in front of you that you can pull out. That'll, they'll be on page uh, 1147. So go ahead, turn there. While you're turning there, let me give you a quick little background on the book of 1 Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians I like to call is like a grand uh, frequently asked questions section like you might find on a website. Okay, that, that were delivered to Paul by the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was dealing with all kinds of diversity within their people of where they came from. And as a result, that diversity also brought a bunch of different kind of immorality. And so there was disagreements, there was fighting, there was uh, divisions that people were kind of splitting into little factions. And so Paul had to address some of their questions on what it meant to follow Christ. And all of this is centered around the gospel of Jesus saving us from our sins and Jesus bringing us to new life and this is how we ought to live as a new community of followers of Christ because of what Jesus did. And so one of the questions that comes up to Paul is about singleness and actually a lot of it has to do with divorce and remarrying within this chapter, chapter 7. And one of the things that Paul says is he says that he wants people to be as he is because he was single. But he also recognizes that this is a gift that some people have and this is not for everybody. And so when we look at the rest of this passage, keep those kind of background things in mind. And one of the main things that he is addressing are this group of people that we'll call for the rest of this morning, ascetics. It's a fun word. What, and these people, what they were basically saying is that it was better for people, for followers of Christ to be single because it made them more holy by not getting married and having relations with their spouse. To abstain from that part of being human was more holy. And so if someone got married because of the fact that there is, uh, we are in this present time waiting for Jesus to return, that it was a sin to get married. And so we'll see how Paul does something very interesting where he both agrees with them, but also disagrees with them. And it's on how, it's all in how he says it. It's pretty awesome. So let's go ahead and look. Verse 25 in chapter 7, we'll begin right there through 28. Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. So when he uses this word virgins, he's meaning women. That's typically how this word is used. But it, I think it relates to all singles, whether they're men or women. And, but he says this very interesting statement where he says, I have no command from the Lord. So this isn't some sort of direct revelation from God that he has gotten, kind of like what he got as the, you know, how he got the gospel message was a direct revelation from God. But he says, because of God's mercy to save me and call me out as an apostle and as also to write scripture and to know God's will for uh, people's lives, he says, I have a trustworthy judgment. So think of this as a much stronger opinion. You know, this is, you know, I could have opinions about many kinds of things. You know, I could say that, you know, I think the Oregon Ducks are the greatest football team out there, right? Okay, go Ducks. But you might disagree with me and I still love you. You're wrong, but I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Okay. Uh, But here's the thing. That's an opinion where Paul is trying to say that it's a trustworthy judgment. This is something that he hasn't gotten direct from the Lord, but because of what God has done in his life, he can say these things. So here's what he says. Because of the present crisis, I think it is good for a man to remain as he is. Because of the present crisis crisis. And the present crisis he's talking about is like the persecution and suffering that the first century 
church was dealing with at the time. They were trying to spread Christ, but the Roman Empire was totally against it. The religious leaders of the Jewish nation were totally against it. And so they were in some pretty dire times. And these are not times that we are in. We are not in that kind of time right now. So he says, because of this present crisis, he says, a man should stay as he is. And what he means is if he is currently single and not married, he, needs to, he should stay that way. If he is married, he should stay that way. You don't get to leave the marriage just because things are a little bit more difficult for Christians at the time. But then he says, he, may, he clarifies this. Verse 28, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. And the reason behind this that he says it's not a sin, but that it is a a preference of his that people would stay single is look at this. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. What he's talking about are the additional burdens of marriage and family. And these are not like sinful burdens. They're not bad burdens, but they are burdens. When I was single, okay, I could go off and spend time with kids in my youth group whenever I wanted. It was I was just totally free. You know, if a kid texted me at eight o'clock at night and said, hey, do you want to go see a nine o'clock showing of a certain movie? I could just go. I didn't have to ask my wife. And now actually I like going to bed earlier. So (laughs) that would be way too late for me. (laughs) But the thing is, is I I had that freedom. But now as a married man and sidebar, I really like being married because yeah, it's fun, okay? <laughs> it's, I like the marriage part of it because it's, there is that, uh, that foundation that you build from. I love having a family and that, that kind of thing. And so when, you have, when you're single, you can go off and do things. But being married, there are some more concerns that I have now that I didn't have when I was single. And so these are these additional troubles. And so Paul's advice is that it's preferable to be single so that you don't, Put those kind of burdens on yourself and be free to serve the Lord, as we'll talk about later. But he wants to clarify, because these ascetics would say, it's a sin. If you go off and get married, it's a sin. God is displeased with that. But Paul is saying, no, it might be preferable to be single, but it's okay to get married. And so kind of some of the thing that we look at is we see this idea being played out by the ascetics, and this is what we first need to learn. And so this is our first principle that we'll learn this morning is that being single or married does not diminish or improve a person's standing before God. We have such a tendency to try and find uh, what I like to say is the secret sauce, okay? That secret thing that could elevate our relationship with Christ or in anything that just could unlock some sort of secret that would be amazing and bring about great joy and flourishing in our life. But the thing is, is being married or single is not that thing. It doesn't do that. And what we have a tendency to do is actually the opposite. Our culture has the tendency to do the opposite of what the ascetics were doing. Okay, they elevated singleness to this level, but we have a really strong tendency to elevate marriage. And I think it's because of the overly, hyperly romanticized culture that we live in. That marriage is like the ultimate culmination of what it means to be a human being. And let me just dispel this. The ultimate culmination of being a human being is having a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the main thing that we should be focused on. And marriage is a wonderful cherry on top of that. Okay, it is a beautiful thing that God has created, but it is not the ultimate thing. And so what tends to happen is when we have this perspective that marriage is this ultimate thing, it tends to create anxiety in people who are not married. And they start to devalue themselves and start to think that, you know, maybe there's just something really wrong with me. Maybe there's, maybe I've got some really big sin issue that God is not letting me get married yet. And maybe I got to reach this certain level of maturity. And let me just tell you, this is not the desire of what, of what God is trying to do here. We don't want to create that kind of anxiety and burden on people who are not married. We don't want to start elevating anything, even if it is marriage, up to that level because then that's where it becomes an idol and no longer something that we use to give to the glory of God. And so we also have this tendency when we try and solve the problem with, of singleness that people might have. And so we might try and say something like this, you know, we might overgeneralize and we might say and solve the problem for a single and we go, okay, here's the problem. Young men, you know what they need to do? They need to move out of mom and dad's basement. They need to stop playing video games. 
they need to get a job, and they need to go get married. When we put that kind of umbrella statement over something like that, we forget about the ones and the personally singles that I know who are great godly men who do play video games, okay? The, but they are responsible, they have jobs, they are doing great things, okay? But they're single. Those aren't the reasons they're single, okay? But we also have a tendency to do this with young women. We might look at them and we need to say, okay, women, stop being so intimidating towards the men. You're just, stop being so awesome. Or <laughs> we might say something like, uh, or I have I've, no joke, I have heard people say this. You might need to lower your standards a little bit. What? That's a whole other ball game of um, not good thinking that we could address some other time, but don't lower your standards. <laughs> That's not a good idea. Or we might say to the women, you know, don't, don't pursue him too much or too little. Man, I did, that just creates anxiety in me thinking about that. Sorry, ladies. Like, I'm real sorry about that, that that's kind of the perception. But so here's the thing. We, we can't be part of the problem to lay this, these kind of concerns and worries onto singles and just continue to remind them that their standing is truly upon Christ, not whether they are married or not. So let's continue. Verse 29. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. And so Paul is going to further clarify what he's been talking about. And he'll say this phrase, the time is short. What he means is now that Christ has come, now that that part of God's redemptive story has happened, now we're waiting for Christ to return. And truly how the New Testament describes it is that it could happen at any moment, five seconds from now, five minutes, five years, 5,000 years. It could happen at any time. We are to stand at the ready, be ready for him to return at any point whatsoever. And so because the time is short, we don't know when he will return, we have to have a completely different perspective. That our perspective should always be with anything in this world because it is going to pass away and hold it with very much an open hand. And to say, God, really, this is yours. This isn't mine. But I'm gonna give, this is yours to take and do with it what you will. This is not mine to hold on to. So he gives these examples of those who have wives should live as if they do not. He's not justifying men abdicating their responsibilities as husbands, that they get to peace out now that Jesus has come. That's not, how, that's not what he means. What he's talking about is that you hold that marriage in an open hand before God, that it is his to rule and reign in it, and that ultimately still you're defined by Christ and Christ is your life. And so all these other things that he talks about are along those lines. But I want to make sure I mention this, those who, this last phrase, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them, because we have such a tendency, I think it's a human problem, but I think in our um, kind of consumeristic culture, we have such a tendency that when we own something or something is ours, that we get really absorbed, and I like that word, engrossed in it that we get really focused on what's right directly in front of us instead of having this perspective that everything we have is temporary. And as Paul says that all of it is going to pass away. We get so focused on the things of our world. We get absorbed in them that these are the ultimate things. These are the most important things instead of saying, what is most important that God wants me to do? And this is something that Paul, I think, embodied in his life. He said this in Philippians 1, that for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he said, everything that I do in my life is defined by Christ. He is the one who determines what my life is about. My life is built, I love that we sang that song, built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That we are built, so, our lives are built solely on Jesus and Jesus alone and not anything else. And what we have tended to do is to build our lives upon other things and that includes marriage, listing that above God. But we can also do this in how we take and, and define ourselves and so we ought to look at the things that we have in front of us and say, these are God's. These are, not, these are not mine. And so this is our second principle, that Christ now determines the focus of our lives, not whether we are married or single. 
That we don't sit here and we don't define ourselves by the fact of whether we're married or single. That we don't sit here and go, okay, I'm, I'm single and, and start to devalue ourselves and say, I'm not important. I'm not essential to the church. I'm not a vibrant part of it. You are an image bearer of God. And as such, you have a huge part to play in this church. You have a huge part to play in what God is wanting to do. You have been given the spirit of God to do incredible things for his purpose and his glory. And getting married is not the penultimate experience of being a human being. It is following Jesus with your life. That is the most important thing you could do. So for those of us who are married and are working with people who are single and we have friends that are single, the, the thing that we could be pushing them towards the most is just saying, follow Jesus, love Jesus, give your life to him. We need to help them cultivate it. But if you also, if you're single, don't wait for somebody to tell you to do it. Go and do it. Go and cultivate that relationship with Christ so that you can really start to say, it is more important that I have him in my life than that I am married. And as a single guy, I'm just gonna tell you, I really struggled with this idea. I think for the longest time, I defined myself by the fact that I wasn't married and I thought really less of myself. I didn't think I was that great of a person because, and really just, self-deprecating kind of thing because I thought that's where my value was in. But let me tell you, after almost, <clears throat> excuse me, almost four years of marriage, I can tell you that if you place your value in your marriage and once it's, you know, marriage happens, it's hard, it's, not, it's hard work, okay? It takes work. Once even just the smallest conflict comes up, that can that can totally change the way you think and really damage your identity. So the thing you have to do is to say, you know what? I am, my life is built on Christ. My life is not built on the fact of whether I am married or not. That is not how I am defined. And I'm not going to let that perspective overshadow the fact that Jesus is in my life, even if I am single. Because, I mean, I'll tell you, marriage is great, it's wonderful, but it's work. And it's not, and it's not perfect. You bring two completely imperfect people together, you're going to have imperfect things happen, okay? <laughs> That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of how God designed it to be, but that it doesn't, and so if we look at it as the ultimate thing, it will fail us, I promise you. Look at verse 32. I would like you to be free from concern, and an unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. And so he's wanting them to be free from anxiety is what he literally means about free from concern, free from anxiety. Because remember, the ascetics were saying it was a sin to get married and it was morally better and right to stay single because of the present crisis they were dealing with. And so now what you're going to, you're hear, you're hearing this teaching from Paul that he's actually sort of agreeing with them. That's going to create some anxiety. And Paul wants to relieve them of that. He says, here's, let me, let me just clarify this even more for you because I don't want you to be anxious about this. And so what he does is he compares unmarried men and married men and also unmarried women and married women, but it's actually kind of mirrored. They're very, very similar, but there's different purposes behind it. So he basically says a married, unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Basically, because he doesn't have those additional burdens of a marriage and family that he has to think about and take care of in a godly way, he is now free to focus solely on the concerns that, of the Lord, of what God wants him to do, how God wants him to live out the great commission and, and share the love of Christ with as many people as he possibly can. But a married man has, as the words he uses, are divided interests. He doesn't mean... It doesn't mean that this is sinful, that he has divided interests. It just is, it just is. It's just, he's stating it as fact, that he's got to think about his family. He's got to think about his kids. So he can't just jump off and go, you know, if a, a mission opportunity comes up, he can't just up and go be, because he wants to. He's got to make sure that his family is taken care of, you know, if the man is married. But if he's unmarried, he can just up and go. He doesn't have to worry about it. He, as long as God is calling, he can go for it. 
And so then he also says that an unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. And look at this. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. Kind of the thing that was happening, this kind of reveals to us, because this is the phrase that's unique that he says to women, but he doesn't say to men because they, they were, again, they were saying this whole idea that it was better to abstain from getting married and staying out of that intimate relationship and the relations behind that, that it was better and it was more holy. It made a person more righteous. But here's the thing is Paul will talk about later. Not everybody's gifted for that and some people want to have that in their lives. And so that actually adds more concern and anxiety upon their life that's completely unnecessary. But she's also concerned of, about how to please her husband. She's concerned about pleasing the Lord, concerned about pleasing her husband. So the interests are divided, but he wants to make sure to clarify this. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you literally to put a noose around your neck. Basically, like to choke the life out of you. I don't want this to, to be a burden on your life. I want this to be something that is good for you, that leads to your flourishing, that would free you up. And then he says that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Oftentimes, what people do with that particular passage is they will think that he is talking to, that he's talking about how singleness is better so that you can live undivided devotion to the Lord. That's not what he means. Because the whole, it doesn't make sense in the context because the whole time he's been talking about how getting married is not a sin and, get, and being single is not a sin, but that it is a bit of a preference of his to be single because of the fact that you are unhindered to, to serve the Lord. But by telling them that it is not a sin to go either direction, he's actually freeing them up and relieving that anxiety, relieving that concern that they might have and so that they could live in that undivided devotion to the Lord. And so this is our third principle, that both, whether married or single, must live completely devoted lives to God despite their anxieties. This is the call upon all of our lives, upon every single one of us. And so as a result, that also means that we need each other. The beauty of how God designed the church is that we need people within the church that are from all different walks of life. So we need, uh, us married people, we need single people in our life to be our friends and to give, to bring us a different perspective. I think we have a tendency to put ourselves into cliques and groups of people that are the same as us. And instead of saying, I'm going to mix and mingle with all kinds of different people from different demographics because God has gifted them and wired them in particular so that they would be for my benefit. That's the beauty of what we call the family of God. But what we have a tendency to do because we put ourselves in these cliques is that we have a tendency to play the comparison game and try and one up one another who's got the bigger problem. And I think uh, if I'm honest, and maybe this is just the way I think these days, but I think it's mostly married people's fault. And he, let me just share an example. This is very classic. You might hear, you know, if I'm talking with a single person and they start telling me, oh my gosh, I'm just, I've been so busy lately. I'm exhausted. The parent of two very small children in me wants to jump out of my skin and say, you know nothing of tired. <laughs> okay? You don't know what that means. <laughs> okay? Like that's the temptation. We want to do that. We want to play that game. And this is actually an example that Delfonso gives in her book that I mentioned earlier, that really what we should do is just go, wow, yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, you've got a job. And to the single people, you've got a job. You've got friends you're trying to keep up with. You've got family. You've got financial concerns. Like, Single people have a laundry list of things that they're concerned about too. And so that we both join in and say, wow, we're both tired. Let's be tired together and be friends <laughs> and care about each other and love each other like Christ has loved us instead of playing the you know nothing of tired type of game, okay? Even if we feel that we are right in saying that, we're wrong in how we approach it and in our attitude by thinking that. And so we need to come across in a much better way saying we're going to live as a family of God and remember that we need each other. So I need single people in my life and I need married people in my life. I need elderly people in my life. I need kids in my life. I need everybody 
in the church in my life in order for God to do the work that he wants to do in my life and to remember that there is no season of life that is more superior than the other. It's just where we find ourselves at currently in our lives before God. Okay, last section, verse 36. If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. And so we kind of, in this passage, we kind of think that Paul has a, a prototypical person in mind when he's thinking about this. That there's this man who is standing and caught in the middle of this debate and that he is feeling like he wants to please the Lord. He loves Jesus. He's given his life to him and he wants to please him. And so he's hearing from these ascetics that are saying, you got to be single or else, or else you're sinning because you're giving in to your own physical desires or you're giving in to your emotional desires of wanting to be in a relationship and be loved. That, that's, that's not what God wants you to do. It would be a sin for you to go over there. And so he, because he wants to please God so badly, he's torn because he also comes over here and goes, well, there's a girl that I really like. I think she's really pretty and I want to marry her. I want to sleep with her. I want to go the, the, whole, the whole thing. Like that, and that's a good and okay thing in the context of marriage okay, that, that God has designed this for. And so now he's feeling this being, being torn in two different directions and again, that noose around the neck, that choking of his life. And so he's feeling this tension and so Paul is telling him, you are not sinning either direction. It's okay for you to go in either direction. He still says, look at the last verse, so then he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better better. It's still his preference because of the fact that it allows for the person to follow Christ in a more unhindered way. But what Paul makes sure to say here is that this is about the conviction that you have, that you ought to, if you have this conviction, you ought to live in it well. And he gives one last example of this, where he says, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, this is verse 39, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. And so he, what he has in mind in this scenario, because he's trying to be fair, talk about a, a, a man's scenario and a female scenario, he's trying to be fair. He says, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. He's talking about a woman who is married, uh, but gave her life to Christ while she was married and her husband is still an unbeliever. And so he is sitting there um, not wanting to believe and she is saying, well, well, what do I do? And he says, stay with, Paul says, stay with him. Don't leave him. But if he dies, you are free to remarry. But he, he still says, but I think it's still better if you stay single so that you can live that unhindered devotion to God. But then he says something very interesting. She is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. I think this is where the opinion factor kind of takes a deeper step for Paul. He must belong to the Lord, where Paul really believes this is important because we have to look at this. The Bible says it over and over again, and it, yes, it's different scenarios, different times, that it, you know, it is not wise to marry someone who is not spiritually compatible with you. And this is, what I, this is where we get this idea. First of all, we get it from the Israelites in the Old Testament who God directly said to them, don't marry the people around you or they will lead you astray. So guess what the Israelites did? They married the people that were around them and were led astray, okay? I, it, it, and so what you see happening is, God, this is a, a common theme, not to give yourself to someone who is not spiritually compatible. And let me just tell you, I've seen this from experience and it's been heartbreaking to watch where I've seen people who were married. I had a friend in college who was married to a woman. He was a youth pastor, but she didn't like that he was a youth pastor. And they were not on the same level spiritually and eventually it led to divorce for them. It was heartbreaking. I've also seen people who got married to someone who was not either not a believer or who was not uh, 
very deep in their faith like they were. And then the marriage just became really difficult trying to be compatible. And those led to divorce as well. And I don't, I don't say that to be, you know, trying to be scary. But what I'm telling you here is that God has designed marriage for something very particular. And it's for the combining of all different kinds of ways that you can relate and connect with a person. And, and I think the deepest way to connect is in the spiritual realm of a relationship with Jesus Christ. That when you have that, and then you combine all the rest of the aspects of the relationship of a marriage, it can create a deep and beautiful relationship. And so, for those of you who are single in this room and you're looking to marry someone, don't settle for someone, especially if they are not a follower of Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus, find someone who wants to follow Jesus too, and you join in that together. And that this is a conviction that we all ought to have as followers of Christ. And so this is our last principle, that we must live freely in the conviction that God has placed upon our lives, whether we are single or married, without fear of sinning. That God has given both of those things to us, that we can go for both of them, and that God has said, these are free choices for you. You can, you can have either one. He, and Paul gives his preference, and let me make sure I say this, his preference is based in the idea of the present crisis that they were in. And yes, it's also based in the idea that the time is short, that Jesus could return at any time, but it is still a beautiful thing that God has said, you can go for it, you can go get married, because he, he, he makes this statement in, in verse 36, that if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, if he is really feeling that he cannot control, have self-control over his over his body, over his mind, and he needs to get married, then it's good for him to go do that. Because God, I think, has gifted certain people, and he says this here, that are not under any compulsion, that feel, that have that conviction and, and are sustained by the grace of God to be able to live a single life, that they ought to do that too. But sometimes I've even seen people who would say, I don't, I don't even think I have that gift of necessarily singleness, but God is providing and sustaining for me during this time while I am waiting. And so here's the thing. I want to close with a few, a few thoughts. First of all, we need to have a much more nuanced understanding of what singleness really means. Because I think oftentimes, like I said earlier, we have those generaliz generalizations that we make. And sometimes we also try and be a little bit overzealous in matchmaking. It's a good desire to see people get married. It's a good thing that we want to see that happen, but we oftentimes can push it a little much. When I was a youth pastor and I was single uh, at my last church where I was a youth pastor, and uh, yes, I got asked many times if I was interested in getting set up, okay? And uh, let me just tell you, it was most of the time people who didn't know me very well, so it was starting to get kind of frustrating because I'd meet the person I could tell within five minutes, uh, this isn't going to work. <laughs> this is not compatible. But, and the, then the irony of me saying that is that my wife, Lindsay, was, also, was a setup, okay? But these people were really, really good friends of ours. And so they knew us really well. And so they knew what we needed, what we were looking for. And so it was at the funny part is the wife of the couple just, it was like this instant moment like clicked in her head, oh, Chris and Lindsay. Let's call it a spirit inspired moment, you know? Uh, but we don't want to give these overgeneralized diagnoses as well as to why people might be single. What we need to do instead is to get into the lives of people, into single people, get to know them, love them, and continue to encourage them to follow Jesus. And so if you're someone in here who is looking for a spouse, you're, you're single and you're, you're in, that, in that time frame of your life, let me just give you a couple pieces of advice. First of all, pursue Jesus with all of your heart. Pursue him. Give your life fully to him and say, I'm gonna follow him with my life. And you know what? This is a call for everybody. But Specifically, make sure that you are being formed by Jesus and you become the kind of person he has called you to be. But let me also, this is my second piece of advice, that doesn't mean that suddenly God is going to, when you reach a certain point, unlock the spouse for you. Now you've reached this maturity level and boom, you've unlocked the spouse. You can now have, you now get married, okay? 
That is not what happens. Because let me just tell you from experience, after almost four years of marriage, I feel like I'm more ready to be married now than I was four years ago. Okay? Four years ago, I, th- I mean, there's a lot of growth that has happened over the four years, how God has worked. And I look back and go, whoa, was I ready? That was four years ago, but was I ready for that? There's a certain level where you're never going to be fully ready for it. But you also want to make sure you don't live in that understanding that God gives this to you as a reward. That sometimes God gives it at the right time because it's the right person. I am so glad I waited for my wife. I am so glad. It was perfect timing and the person that fits the best. We're not perfect people, you know, <laughs> when you, like I said earlier, it's not, we're not perfect people, so imperfect people don't create a, two perf- imperfect people do not create a perfect marriage. But it is a good and glorious and beautiful thing because of the fact that we are spiritually compatible and both love Jesus and have a similar goal in mind. But I also want to address people in here who are single who may be past the time of Uh, you know, maybe for them, they think they're past the time of getting married or past the time of some other desires that they might have of having children. Let me just remind you, as a church, there are still opportunities for you to jump in, be a part of the mission here, and to be a spiritual parent for people, to show them what it means to follow Jesus. You don't have to wait for your own children to do that. But I have also seen people where God sustains them. Even if you're sitting there and you're in your 40s and 50s and you're, you haven't ever been married and you're sitting there going, God, is this ever gonna happen? Just continue to pray for God to sustain you, for God to give you the life that you need because that's what he does. He gives us the grace. We actually sang this in a song earlier, weak made strong. Even if you're feeling weak in that, because of what Christ has done for us and his spirit living in us, he can make us strong to be sustained even in seasons of life that we are not super thrilled with. This is the beauty of who God is. This is what he does for us. So even if you are sitting there and you're wanting to be married, pray for God to sustain you and to make you strong where you have been weak. And so let's keep this overarching thought in mind as we finish out this morning. For singles to be healthy, they must recognize that Christ determines the value of their life and that singleness is not a judgment on their character, but an opportunity to serve the Lord as a whole church.